thank you. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike Caden. Uh, I work on Uber's communications platform, which is like mostly seated right here in front of you. Um, as you can guess, uh, at Uber, uh, we send a lot of text messages, and we do a lot of voice calls. And a lot of that is powered by Twilio. So um, I want to thank them for having us here. What I'm going to chat about today is what it takes to produce uh, and, and create all those messages uh, in a global system at high scale. Some of the things that we do to make sure that we're trying to get every single message that we can to the end user that we're trying to get to. Uh, I used to be a high school teacher before I was an engineering manager, and so I have this, this thing in my soul where I have to start out every talk that I do with an agenda, just like I used to do with my high school students. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about this. First, I'll just kind of introduce the team itself, uh, a little bit about what we've been working on, uh, and then I'll kind of open this up with this idea that sending an SMS with an API like Twilio's is something that's actually really easy. Um, and uh, we'll talk about kind of where we started and how easy it was, and then kind of what became more complex and what we're doing now. I'll talk a little bit about our systems architecture, and then I'll also talk uh, for a while about some of the specific solutions that we're using those systems, uh, you know, that we've come up with using those systems uh, to make sure that every message that we want to send gets delivered. Um, so yeah, let's start. We'll talk about the team. Like I said, this team at Uber is called the Communications Platform Team. It's got uh, 10 engineers on it at this point. Um, we're all mostly back-end engineers. We've been working on this problem space for about a year. Um, and uh, it wasn't uh, 10 people for a year, else our systems would be a lot better than they are right now. But it started out with three of us for the last year. And we're not just responsible for SMS and voice and Uber, but also email, push notifications, integrations with marketing providers, as well as uh, voice calls, translations, and various forms of in-app messaging. And so uh, yeah, we have probably more services or more scopes to take care of than we have people on the team for most of the time the team existed. Um, but uh, specifically today, we'll be talking about the sort of uh, telephony, so SMS and, and voice calls and the stuff that we've been building in that, in that realm. Um, so yeah, let me kind of introduce the topic I want to talk about uh, with this kind of anecdote or, or idea that SMS is really easy. So what I want to say is uh, me and everybody else on our team, uh, we've never built uh, you know, AT&T's voice platform or Twilio's voice platform or anything like that. And the API that Twilio and other kind of providers like them provide makes the wild world this crazy telephony stuff uh, manageable for developers like us. You know, we learned how to code on the street. We didn't learn uh, you know, anything about uh, all this crazy uh, you know, telephony integrations. Um, we're using simple REST APIs from uh, Twilio to be able to be successful uh, in, in kind of integrating into the broader system at Uber. Um, and so the result of that is that SMS, right, generally is pretty easy. If you use one of these third-party providers, uh, I'll just copy Twilio's documentation from its website. You just simply import their client and call create message on it, and that's all you need to do. You just pass it kind of a from number, a to number, and the content of the message. And thank goodness for that. That's easy enough if you want to send one text message. Um, and when Uber started and we had, you know, uh, thousands of users and uh, you know not a ton of concurrency and this sort of simple code was all that we needed to be successful in the business when we were only in one or two cities all in the United States but in actuality when you get to scale when you get to the size where your marketplace is global uh, it takes a lot more work to make SMS uh, successful and it no longer becomes that easy thing that that, that I just showed you and so what we've done is we've designed systems that are actually quite complex, but they're built around these simple APIs. So thank goodness those APIs are simple, but the integrations, they become complex. And the reason why is because if you want to achieve that reliability and deliverability around the world at high scale, there's all kinds of edge cases that start to emerge from the corners uh, that you have to deal with. Um, and also, you have to plan for failure, right? As we have dozens of boxes running our services on them, as we uh, are going to lose connectivity to a particular country or particular region, uh, we need to be ready for that fa failure uh, and have you know, options to use uh, as, as a backup. So let me show you a little bit of our systems that we have designed at Uber so you can get a feel for what we're doing to, uh, to, to uh, enable that kind of scale and then also to, um, you know, to have resiliency in the case of failure. All right, so uh, at Uber, uh, most of the back end is written in one of two languages. Either it's in Python or it's written in Node.js. Uh, the majority of the back end business logic group, like ours, is written in Python. We believe in the speed of development that uh, uh, you know, a duck type language or a non type language will, will provide for you. And that's why a lot of our work is written in Python. We can have that fast iteration where we can do you know, dozens of deploys in a day at Uber. Our infrastructure, I don't know if you went to the containers talk earlier, runs on bare metal and we believe in that. Uh, you know, there might be some containers in our future for sure, um, but at the moment we're not running on any virtualization, we're not running on any cloud platform, we run our own servers, we run our own stuff on it. 
Uh, we use all kinds of the common things that you'd expect from a, a, a big kind of technology stack these days. We're using Kafka for message passing. We're building all of our microservices on top of Flask. We use Postgres. We have very mixed feelings about using it. Um, we also use a bunch of MySQL and other more experimental databases for sure. Redis is used extensively across our stack, both as a message broker for a queuing system and also as a sharded cache uh, behind Swim Proxy. Uh, and then we also use a Python project called Celery to do our kind of asynchronous job processing to make sure that uh, we can build up queues and, and process through them asynchronously. Uh, let me tell a little bit about specifically the communications platform's architecture. I'm going to talk about two pieces of the puzzle. There's, there's a broader ecosystem, but I want to talk about notifications, you know, that your Uber is arriving now, text message that you might receive, and I want to talk about uh, SMS messaging service. So let's start with the notification service. This service is built so that Kafka events are coming in consumed from other upstream services at Uber. So for example, if you're going to take a trip, uh, you're gonna, uh, you know, some event's gonna get generated that says, you know, this driver is assigned to this rider, uh, and that event stream is gonna come down into the notification service. It's gonna process that event by calling out to other Uber services to find out things like people's first names, things like the driver's rating, so that we can construct the text of the notification for that event. Uh, and then we're gonna push out that notification to, in this case, some push notification providers like Apple's push notification service for Google Cloud Messaging. Um, some users, however, you know, they may not prefer that push, or perhaps uh, in, a, in a market like China where we can't access Google, we're going to use uh, SMS messaging. So we have a separate SMS service it's decoupled from the notification service to make sure that we can send SMS uh, for those particular users. And this SMS service kind of acts as an abstraction between SMS providers. Twilio is Uber's number one SMS provider. We love them. They're amazing. Uh, but we do have other providers that we use as well. Um, of course, other services at Uber may want to trigger notifications uh, directly to SMS. So for example, a mobile verification text message that we send when you sign up will come from the sign up service directly into our SMS service. And so what you can see here is we have decoupled the idea of notifications from SMS themselves. We can lose the notification service and still be able to confirm mobile numbers. We can lose the SMS service and still be able to send push notifications. Uh, these things are, are, are independent of each other. And because we have these multiple uh, SMS providers, we can set up one provider as a failover in case one of them goes down, um, or in, in case we lose connectivity in a particular market. Uh, so let me just show you that flow real quick. The driver taps the phone uh, and says, you know, I accept that ride. This Kafka event, a piece of JSON, flows into the notification service, which is then going to go out and fetch data to kind of convert partner X and rider Y into first names and driver ratings. That's going to get called into the SMS service, which will process that, uh, that, that event and send it out to one of the third-party providers. Similarly, one of the uh, other services at Uber that might be interested in sending a text message can send that message straight up to the SMS service, which will send it out again through one of the providers. So we kind of have this kind of separation of concerns. All the microservices at Uber are not in the business of sending text messages. That's the job of the SMS service. Uh, and the SMS service is separate from actually generating the notifications that we might be sending. Let's dig into this SMS service uh, just a little bit uh, so we get a feel for what's going on inside there, a little bit of the lower level architecture within our services. This is a very similar uh, setup at Uber. There's a lot of different services. Uh, we have HTTP workers, which accept HTTP requests, but they don't spend a lot of time processing those requests uh, synchronously, OK? We're going to validate that the request that you're making to the SMS service is valid. Then we're simply going to enqueue it for processing after the fact. So the HTTP request to send a text message comes in. We're going to put it into a queue. We do our queuing in Redis using Celery, like I described before. And then there's a bunch of asynchronous job workers that are going to process those Redis, that Redis queue. They're going to uh, you know, go out to other services to uh, find out, say, the user's phone number. And then they're going to uh, persist the log of that message, maybe grab some configuration from our database about what kind of uh, uh, you know, what phone number to be sending from, what, how should this be configured. And then we're going to actually make the call out to the third party provider. Um, so uh, you know, one thing that's important, right? let's just do this flow. We're going to have the, uh, the request come in at our endpoint and enqueue it, say, hey, rider X, we want to send them this verification code. Okay. We actually have two different queues, actually multiple queues, but, but two queues for different SLAs. So for example, if we have a, a less important one, you know, your insurance is about to expire, it's definitely important, but we don't need to get it to that driver in the next moment like we do for somebody who just signed up. So we're going to give priority and make sure we have higher hardware uh, uh, dedicated to this high queue. The asynchronous workers are going to pull out that thing out of the queue. They're going to process rider X and turn it into a phone number to send to. 
They're going to persist to Postgres the fact that we sent the message, and they're also going to pull up configuration about what from number to use based on the user's configuration, whether they're a rider, whether they're a driver, whether they are from the United States, and so on. And then we're going to send that call out to Twilio. Does that make sense? I guess we can't do this interactively, so you can just nod your head. <laughs> cool. After that, we'll take care of the other notification. Right? We want to make sure they all get out there, but we can do uh, you know, different speeds at which we process different queues. Cool. Uh, part of the resiliency here is to make sure that we don't lose this system in, in case one box goes down. So of course, there are multiple HTTP workers load balanced across multiple boxes. And of course, we have a huge pool of asynchronous job workers. In case one goes down, we're not going to suddenly stop queuing all of our, or, uh, unqueuing all of our, all of our text messages. Uh, each of the Redis uh, boxes has a slave that's being uh, replicated off it, so we don't lose something if we lose that. And of course, Postgres has slaves as well. So if any one box or even a couple of boxes goes down in this system, we're not going to lose everything. We'll be able to fail over as we need. Um, cool. So that's just a little bit about our overall architecture. Now I want to dig into some specific solutions that we've built on top of this. Now I want to say, uh, not this data center failover one that I'm going to start with, but reacting to delivery field back and pooled numbers. It sounds like uh, Uber, uh, sorry, Twilio just released uh, this as a feature, so you can enjoy it. Uh, we've had to build it in the last year. So um, I'll tell you about a little bit of how successful it is so you can be excited about the new product that Twilio has to offer. Um, OK, let's talk about data center failover. So um, you know, Uber has this anonymous communication system. When you call the driver or the driver texts you, uh, you're not actually interacting with the driver's actual phone number. The driver never sees your phone number, and you never see theirs. It protects the privacy of both parties involved. And so when you get that text message from the driver that says, you know, I'm outside, uh, you don't actually get that driver's text message number, and you won't be able to text them later. Um, and that communication is actually critically important to the success of the trip. I think this goes to what Jeff was talking about earlier with contextual communications and how important it is for your business. When we lose this ability to communicate, we lose trips. And people become frustrated. Drivers can't find their riders. Riders can't find their drivers. Uh, and, and Uber becomes that not that amazing, beautiful experience. We just press a button and a car shows up. Um, and I can show you that in a graph. This happened from an outage during a data center failover about uh, eight or nine months ago. Um, what you're looking at with no y-axis very intentionally is the number of driver cancels uh, when, uh, during, during an outage. So the red line is uh, from the previous week. It's the number of driver cancels that we would expect during a particular time. Okay? And then the blue line is the number of driver cancels during a data center failover where we lost the anonymous comm system, where users were getting errors back instead of being able to communicate with their drivers. You can see the drivers immediately started canceling rides because if they couldn't find the rider, they had to move on. When we saw this graph, we figured we really needed to figure out a way such that if we lost the data center, um, the rest of the Uber application was functioning just fine, but we needed to make sure we had a data center failover strategy specifically for our anonymous comm system. Uh, actually, Twilio provides some really good features for this. Let me show you how it works. So here's the anonymous comm service. This is kind of a simplification of how it actually works, because the actual one is far too complex, uh, not, and not in a good way. Uh, so when, when you make a phone call or a text message to a Twilio number, Twilio is going to make an HTTP request into an anonymous comm service, you know, whatever endpoint you give it to call into. Um, and then we're going to check in the database to figure out, OK, you know, based on phone number A or phone number B, you know, who does it map to? Who does it belong to? Uh, and then we'll figure out where this should be forwarded onto. So this is basically how it works. You know, uh, a phone number request, you, know, you text the driver. The driver's phone number comes into our service. We figure out where it belongs. And we tell Twilio to forward that text along to a different number. Relatively simple. Now, uh, Twilio has some good features for what can happen if some of these things fail. For example, if the uh, initial request fails, uh, Twilio will retry on what they call a fallback URL. Okay? And uh, by default, I think they'll just retry on the same URL. So if you have a transient failure, if your service blips for a second, or you lose uh, the ability to, to connect to your database, it's going to retry a moment later, and maybe you'll be successful. And that's pretty cool. Um, but the question is, what happens if we lose the entire anonymous comm service or the whole data center that it's in? How do we plan for that failure instead? And what you can do with that fallback URL is actually point at a whole separate instance of this service running out of another data center. Okay, with a slave database that is, uh, you know, that is replicating off the master in the other database, such that you know, if the first call fails from Twilio, the second call will go to the other data center. We'll still be able to communicate as we did before. Okay? Then when everything gets back, we can fall back uh, the other way. 
Um, and so uh, this is a nice feature that Twilio provides. Uh, there are other providers that provide it as well. Um, and this has enabled us to have a totally seamless experience should we end up uh, in a data center failover at Uber, uh, which has probably happened before. If you live in San Francisco, you're probably taking a bunch of Ubers. It's probably happened before while you're in a car. And at this point, it's a totally seamless experience, both from a comms perspective and the rest of Uber. Cool. Um, Let's talk about reacting to delivery feedback. And like I said, I think this is kind of built into Twilio now, so you should be really excited about the results I'm about to present. Um, so of course, uh, DLR, delivery receipts, are um, these web hooks that Twilio will offer back to you, okay? So as your message goes along the path from Twilio to the carriers to the end user's phone, you're gonna get these web hooks, these posts back to the endpoint that you specify that will tell you about the progress of that message. So for example, when I send an SMS, when it gets passed to the carriers, I'm gonna get this sent webhook back from Twilio saying, okay, it's out of our hands now. And then when the carriers get it to the phone, I'm gonna get this delivered webhook that's gonna say, yeah, all right, they got it. Okay, if for some reason that last leg fails, I'm gonna get something back like failed or undelivered from, uh, from Twilio, and that will tell me that this message did not arrive. Now, originally at Uber, we were uh, consuming these events, but simply kind of logging them, putting them in a data warehouse so we could analyze them after the fact. But uh, when we started to realize that we could use them more actively, uh, we designed the system that I'm about to describe. So here's what we have that's a little bit more complex. Uh, we have our SMS service, and it has a database that actually stores a configuration of multiple numbers, and it stores them in order, so we can kind of decide in what rank we should try what SMS senders. So for example, uh, when I make this request up front, because the 89203 short code that we send most of our text messages from is at the top of the list, I'm gonna try that first. I'm gonna send it off to Twilio. Twilio's gonna respond with what they call an SID or a, you know, some, an ID that represents this message. I'm gonna persist that in some fast storage in Redis here for a moment. And then when that message gets passed to the carriers, I'll get the sent event, that's all well and good. And then when it gets passed to the end user's phone, oh, oh, no, actually, if it fails to get to the end user's phone, I'm gonna get a webhook back that says, hey, that failed, okay? I can look up that ID in this Redis, I can pull up all the details of the message that I just tried to send, and I can go back into the Postgres database and look, okay, what's the next SMS sender that I should be using in this list, and regenerate the message trying with the long code this time. And if you're familiar with this particular problem, I think some users on T-Mobile, some users on some smaller carriers, they can't receive these short code messages. And so when we implemented this redelivery and started sending messages for a second time when we got this delivery feedback, we saw a massive jump in our mobile verification rates. Uh, it was like we just turned it on one day and the people from growth came down and, and Hug Ying here who put, who put it together. Uh, and uh, so if, if this is not something you're doing or if the new Twilio thing doesn't uh, provide all the hotness that this does, Consuming these DLR events is definitely something that you want to start doing. Uh, you can really improve your throughput, or sorry, not your throughput, but your conversion rate to make sure that you're getting as many messages to your end users as possible. Um, cool, let's talk about pooled numbers. This is another thing, <coughs> excuse me, that apparently Twilio has built, um, and I guess uh, I can tell you it's very effective. So pooled numbers is what we call it. It seems like they're actually calling it the same thing. Uh, which is, is funny because apparently naming things is hard in computer science, but I guess we're both equally good at it or equally bad. Um, so what do we use this for? So we send out text messages that probably all of you have seen before for your Uber is arriving now or maybe when you signed up for doing mobile verification. But we also send quite a bit of text messages to our drivers, okay? One of the big use cases for that is about the, uh, the efficiency of a mar the, the Uber marketplace, right? So, Uber is a marketplace. We're trying to match up in real time the people who need rides, the riders, and the people who are providing rides, the supply drivers, okay? Um, and so if those people and places are together, uh, then the, the market operates a lot more efficiently. And that's why we do things like Surge to try and move drivers to the place in the city where, uh, where the most uh, rides are available, trying to match up the supply and demand so that there's less inefficiency in the market. And one of the ways that we can do that if there's a major event in the city is to let drivers know about kind of the timing of that event, right? Because we can watch, you know, we can see how the demand is shaped in real time. So, um, you know, when outside lands ends in Golden Gate Park, we can send a text message to all our drivers and say, hey, outside lands just ended in Golden Gate Park. Uh, you know, let's, uh, let's go see, there's a lot of rides available over there. You should head over that way if you, if you want to get extra rides. Um, and so, Originally at Uber, we could send a text message to all the drivers you know, three years ago with a single long code and have it get there timely. 
Um, but we can't, you know, send out a billion text messages from one long code from Twilio or otherwise because we'll either be marked as spam or Twilio won't allow you to send more than one long, uh, message on a long code per second. And so instead we have a massive pool of phone numbers that we send our text messages through. Um, and that way we can send all these messages to all these drivers in a short period of time so we're not delivering them a stale message two hours later when outside lands is over, okay? So we can also use this pooled numbers thing to send bulk text messages at a high rate of delivery. Um, let me tell you a little bit about how this works. I'm not the expert on this math. Uh, you have to talk to some of the engineers on the team afterwards if you want to know about it. Um, but you can use a, a technique called consistent hashing. This is different from normal hashing. And what it does is um, it makes the numbers that you have. So if I take, for example, a user's ID or a user's phone number, I pass it through this hash. I can assign it to a particular one of the pooled numbers, uh, and it's going to hash that same number every time. Okay? So that's how we get it to be sticky to a driver. And then similarly, when we uh, and, and, and what's nice about that is we don't have to store some mapping in the database of every driver to the number that's sticky to them. We just simply hash their number, and we can distribute them around this ring here in a consistent hashing algorithm. OK, then of course, if we add or subtract a number from the pool or a bunch of numbers from the pool, if we were using a regular hashing algorithm, it would reshuffle every driver's number every time we did that. But instead, if we, say, have 1,000 numbers and add 200, only 20% of the drivers, existing drivers, you know, will have their numbers switched. Um, so this consistent hashing algorithm is really great for making sure that you can keep stuff sticky to, uh, you know, to the, the person you're sending to, and then also make sure that you don't have to have a bunch of database overhead to maintain those mappings, and that you're keeping a consistent user experience for your end users. And even the term sticky, I believe, is in the, 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 new, the new Twilio product. So um, you, you can hear more about it there, I guess. Um, OK, last solution that I want to show you that we're pretty pumped up about is called continuous deliverability monitoring. Um, and this system uh, is, is something that we just put together kind of in a hack hackathon, and we've been working on a little bit more over time. We call it the ping pong system. And here's what we've done. You know, what we've found is <clears throat> Uber's in uh, 300 plus cities in 50 plus countries. Um, and uh, to achieve high deliverability in SMS around the world is extremely difficult in that environment. Okay? There's just a couple of us here in San Francisco that are managing that. And uh, you know, normally what we were doing before is if we were having trouble with deliverability in China, you know, we could shut off mobile verification in China for the day, endure the massive fraud rates that would come out of something like that, okay? and then send, it, you know, send a bunch of test messages, and then email the folks in China and say, hey, which ones did you get? Of course, it's the middle of the night over there, so we'll hear back the next day that, oh, we got, we got it on this one and that one. We'll go back to the carrier, to, to the provider like Twilio and say, hey, this one didn't go through. Can you adjust your routing? And so on. This iteration cycle was taking forever. It was really slow for the business, and it was really stopping us from being able to get good SMS deliverability everywhere where we're at. Now, as a result, we developed this system we call Ping Pong. We put phones on the ground around the world ourselves, and we're paying them constantly with text messages, to, and they're pinging us back with whether or not they receive them. And uh, we've just built this out. Uh, we don't have it in every country that we're in yet. I think the way I've laid the phones out in this slide is pretty accurate. We have phones in India, France, the UK, Colombia, the United States. Um, we had one in Egypt for a couple days. We just turned that off. We have it in China. We're going to have it in more places. And what we want to have is a phone, at least one, on every carrier. Um, so that we can do this debugging in real time like I just described, but even go further and actually get continuous deliverability monitoring. To pull this off, we had to write a custom Android app that we deployed on the phones that will read the text messages and then post the result back to our HTTP endpoints. Like I said, there's 30 phones around the world. We ping these things hourly. We gather statistics on which uh, networks we're getting good deliverability to. And like I said, we're planning for failure, right? So the idea, and this isn't quite implemented yet, but we're moving towards it as fast as we can, is that if we detect a failure in, say, India, um, we can use this ping pong service to then test an alternative provider, make, if we get good deliverability there, then adjust the configuration in that Postgres database that ranks the senders that I discussed before. So we want to start making these changes to routing in real time. Um, and uh, this, this uh, continuous deliverability monitoring system, ping pong, is going to give us an opportunity to do that. Um, so I'd like to demonstrate it real quick. I have a couple minutes left. Um, so let me do that. So um, let's see. So this is a real phone in, on the ground in, where are we? In China. Okay, it's in the People's Republic of China. It sits on the, on the ground in Beijing. It's on the China mobile network. Um, this is the phone number of it. Please don't text it. Um, it's off the screen now. We might have to get a new one. Um, 
let's see, over the last four hours, uh, five hours, we've sent five text messages to this phone with the content hello, and we've received that message back. This is the phone number that we're receiving it from with our current configuration. We can see the difference between sent at and received at, so we have some idea of the latency that we're introducing as the, as the SMS uh, traverses the network. Um, so I'll send a real text message, hi, from Signal. Um, we're all excellent front-enders here on the communications platform team, so uh, we've written a beautiful UI for this purpose. Um, I'll refresh the page, and you can see the, the message arrived there. It took about five seconds to get there. It was prepended with this, uh, you know, this signature, which is common in China. Um, and uh, you know, we can actually, one of the things that's important for this uh, debugging system as well is that a lot of times, whether it's Unicode or some other interchange problem, uh, you know, the content of the message could arrive garbled as well. So we can also compare what actually arrived at the phone to what we sent to make sure that the right content uh, actually got there. All right. Cool. Um, so yeah, those are the four uh, solutions that I kind of want to describe today. Uh, I hope those were informative. I think uh, the, the failover idea and this continuous deliverability monitoring system might be useful for some of the bigger folks out there, and the failover idea is definitely interesting, even if you just want to replay your own uh, requests inside your own service. Um, also interesting, the delivery, the delivery feedback information might be useful for you, even if Twilio is going to start re-delivering those messages for you on the new, uh, the, new, the new product they've launched. This is important data for you to be taking a look at. Right? You can see if 10% of your messages are failing, and you can start putting those into graphs, monitoring them, and making sure that you know, there isn't suddenly a jump of 30% of them. That you, you can react to it. Um, so I'll go back to what I said in the beginning real quick. You know, at global scale, nothing is simple. Okay. Even sending a text message with a simple API like Twilio's is, is, is pretty easy when you're just sending a, you know, a message to the United States to a, a small set of users. As things get bigger, you know, thank goodness for Twilio's simplicity, because now you can build complex applications on top of it to achieve uh, you know, much bigger goals, much bigger scale. You have to worry always about these edge cases. They're going to emerge as you get closer. As you try to extract more nines out of your deliverability and availability, try to get to uh, making sure that every single message is delivered to the user that you intend, these edge cases will be something that you have to start focusing on and figuring out. And of course, plan for failure, right? Things are going to break. Things are going to go down. Providers, and Twilio is, is unbelievably stable, but they, you know, every, everybody goes down. Even, even our platform goes down, right? So you need to plan for that. You need to make sure that you have a, a backup plan and you have a failover uh, scenario planned out with the right hardware and the right configuration in your application. That's everything I wanted to jam about. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'll be totally that guy and just note that we, like the rest of Uber, is hiring. If you're interested, you can come chat with me after the talk for sure. Um, whether you're interested in the communications platform or, or the whole team in general, we're, we're always looking for smart folks. Um, and then personally, for this presentation, please uh, you know, drop some feedback at me. It'd be really helpful. I'm sure I'll give this talk again somewhere else. Uh, and I'd love the feedback. You can just text that number. Uh, thanks very much. <laughs>